Glenn Reichert. Good morning, everybody. Technology is a wonderful and interesting thing. About every 30 to 40 years, something major changes. It's an S-curve. If you look up, Everett Rogers has shown that the adoption of technology is at first slow, then very rapid, and then at the conclusion, it tails off and another technology comes and takes its place. You can see this happening in television, first black and white TV, about 40 years later, color TV, about 40 years later, high definition TV. Hopefully it won't take 40 years to get to ultra high definition TV, but these things change every period of time. And the internet and ethernet is about how old? So it's about time. It's about time for some major inflections and some major change. And I think you're going to hear all morning about some of those major changes, some of the folks who are leading those changes at some of the uh, leading companies and other places where those, that change is happening. I think that the changes are going to really be uh, uh, profound in the sense that they're going to impact people's lives. And I have begun working with a nonprofit organization, US Ignite, on how these changes might impact people's lives. So this is a picture in the South Auditorium of the White House when we launched US Ignite on June 12, 2012. You can see that every seat is filled. When US Ignite was launched, and US Ignite is about new applications of these new technologies, we had John Holdren, the head of the Office of Science and Technology Policy for the United States. We had Subra Suresh, the director of the National Science Foundation. We had Julius Janikowski, the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. We had I'm pressing it. If you'd advance the slide, please. We had Larry Strickling, the head of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. All of these folks were there to celebrate the launch of a new nonprofit organization. It's not a government organization. It's more like a, uh, it's a nonprofit, a stickning. It's, um, working with the government but works independently and works together with other parties to go and launch US Ignite. So what is US Ignite? As I said, it's a public-private partnership. It's government working together with the private sector in a nonprofit way. And the magic numbers up there, 501c3, mean something to Americans who recognize that as the section of the Internal Revenue Service Code that says that this is a nonprofit organization. We have a major simple goal, to take these new technologies and turn them into new applications that benefit citizens of the world. We want to see next generation applications. And you see there in orange the areas that are being impacted. At the top, clean energy, going around clockwise, advanced manufacturing, public safety, transportation, healthcare, education. Important things that impact people everywhere. What can these technologies do for them? And we're working together with a number of communities. We work with industry, with government, research and education, foundations, communities, and other organizations who were allied in this goal to help make the next generation of technology turn into beneficial applications for citizens of the world. We have three goals at US Ignite. The first is to create 60 compelling, transformative applications based on things you couldn't do today. 
based on new technologies, things that you've been hearing about and will hear about today, uh, software-defined networking, local cloud computing, taking gigabit to the end user, reducing latency, things that are going to change the way the internet works today. Second, that we get 200 community test beds, 200 communities who are eager and willing to adopt these new technologies and their applications. And third, to coordinate best practices among these communities, among the industry partners, and to make sure that government, industry, and communities are working together to make this goal happen. These are the partners for US Ignite. You'll see here some industry companies. You'll see here some communities. You'll see here a number of folks who are working together to make US Ignite happen. Am I in your way? I'll move a little bit so that I'm not in your way there. I wanted to make sure you had a sight line so that you could see. OK, you're good. All right. I worry about you. I just wanted you to know. She speaks Portuguese, so I wanted to make sure that uh, we had a good conversation later. OK. Um, and again, this is not, oops, was advancing. The next generation infrastructure, I think, will have three big important spokes. Number one is the use of virtualization and software-defined networking. Those are not quite the same, but they're close enough that I'm going to put them into one category for this morning. And for all those who will come later and say they're not the same, I agree, they're not quite the same, but I still put them in about the same category. These are things that are going to change the business model, the business model for how networks work and are charged for. The second is local cloud computing, and I will speak about this in my talk. And the third is that we don't need necessarily more speed. We need more responsive ability to reach the end user, and I'll talk about that. So I'm going to mainly speak about numbers two and three because I believe other folks today will talk about the first one up there. Okay, so there it is. I'm pressing carefully. I thought I would tell you my punchline first. This is the, the whole talk revolves around these three changes. First, that today we think that more bandwidth is bigger. And I think that's going to change. The new version is going to be more responsive is better. And I use the word locavore. That word is used uh, in the food industry to mean eating foods grown near you. And I'm using it to mean consuming computing cycles and networking located near you. Second, today we think about putting things into a massive data center, into a massive cloud, concentrating many, many, many computers all in the same place. I think that is going to change, and we're going to see the cloud coming to you to be more responsive to the applications. The third is that today we think that if we have a big enough internet pipe, that will be fine and traffic won't conflict, and that's true. But I think over time, and especially for wireless, it's going to be much more important to use our resources more efficiently. And tomorrow, multiple dynamic virtual pipes will be purpose-built, will be bespoke per application. So those are the points I'm going to make. Uh, and now that you know all about them, I'd like to go and start with uh, more bandwidth is better. I have an internet connection in my home which is about uh, 20 to 25 megabits per second from Comcast. And of course, I would like it to be faster. But would it really do me much good? I did an experiment. Here's the experiment that I did. I went and measured how many web page loads per second I could get. On the right-hand side is my connection unaltered. And you can see I did this experiment a number of times. It's not always the same. You can see the number of web page loads there. OK, pretty decent. It's about one per second, a little bit less than one per second. That's very typical. 
Then I went and I found an old, as I said yesterday, an old Ethernet hub in my closet, which was only 10 megabits. And so I went and I put that into the circuit. I did a speedtest.net. It said it was about six and a half megabits. So I then took the same readings, running it through that hub to slow things down. And you can see that I got fewer page loads per second, as you would expect. But I didn't get half. From speedtest.net, the speed tripled between 6 and 22, but I didn't get three times the number of page loads, did I? In fact, it only went up 23%. So clearly something else is going on. Why is it that when I tripled the speed, I didn't get triple the page loads? Well, there's actually a very good reason. This is what happens between my computer and the place giving me all those page loads. There's all these routers and links in between. And in fact, the only one whose speed I changed was that, um, actually the second to the last one from my computer route. Now, my computer to my home router was the same fast speed, but when I changed the link going to uh, Comcast, my provider, uh, that changed. So only one of those links changed speeds. Now, of course, the weakest link will determine the speed, but uh, as these things go, it had to go through all these other links in order to get to the server, which was in a massive data center. Where was that server? I ran a technical program which allows me to see where, my, where all of those things were. So I tracked down each one of those things, and in each one of those things, you can see the number of milliseconds over three different tries and where it went. So my traffic actually, I live in Salt Lake City, so the first things you see up there are Salt Lake City. If you know your American geography, it then sent it east to Denver. Denver sent it east to Chicago. Chicago sent it east to Washington, D.C. It rattled around Washington, D.C. for a while, was handed off to Yahoo. Uh, my, the website I was going after was finance.yahoo.com. Goes off to Yahoo. Yahoo went and took it through a series of cryptic things, but I did do some work to find out where these were located, and it sent it all the way back across the United States to right here, Sunnyvale, and that's where the server was that provided the uh, service. So my traffic went to Washington, D.C., rattled around for a while, came back to Sunnyvale, and you can see that it took about 65 to 80 milliseconds. The amount of time that people can distinguish that something takes is about 50 milliseconds. So this is a noticeable amount of time just to go and get my request to Yahoo and get it back. That's not providing for any time for the server to do its work of actually fetching the information I'm interested in. So that's why this thing does not change even though my end system was um, much more, I changed the speed there. So going to a gigabit on that last link is probably not going to make that much difference in fact, there's another experiment. This was done by uh, Microsoft Research. This shows you how long it takes with um, different kinds of uh, a bandwidth of one megabit. You can see all of these are all about the same. When they did it again at 10 megabits, you can see that when they invoked something called SPDY, Speedy, which goes back and forth fewer times, that the uh, bottom two lines there are lower and it takes less page load time. So we think that just from these two graphs, the point to take is that as the speed goes up, the importance of the length of that chain goes up. As the speed goes up, the fact that there are more links in the chain makes more difference. So as the internet grows and as it gets faster, the length of that chain makes more difference. So, What's the obvious thing that's going to happen in the future? Make this chain shorter. That's about the only thing we can do. We have speed of light considerations of getting things out there. The number of times it gets handled makes a difference. So we want to go to a local cloud or local VOR computing. How soon will this happen? Well, interestingly enough, it's already happened, starting to happen. AOL has begun putting in what they call micro data centers. This is a micro data center they put in in Dulles, Virginia, to be closer to the end user so they can be more responsive. And studies have shown that people buy more and that people uh, will be able to 
uh, stay with your service longer if you're more responsive. So uh, one of the things that Mike Manos, the chief technology officer of AOL Services has said, is that we expect that micro data centers will enable us to roll out five times the amount of total compute capacity in less than 10% of the cost and the physical footprint of a traditional data center-based deployment. And if you want to go look this up on the web, just um, Google or Bing, your choice, whatever service you want, micro data center and AOL, and you'll find this quote and, and the other pictures. So this is what's going to happen. It's also happening in research and education in the United States. There's a research project by the name of Genie. And the Genie project not only facilitates this local cloud computing, but it also facilitates federating these local clouds, bringing the local clouds together so that when you need more compute than one of these local data centers can provide, you can do that by aggregating them together. So you can have the best of both worlds. For simple things, very responsive, it's close to you. For more complex things, you can federate services from multiple local clouds. It will take a bit longer, but still you will be able to have that ability to aggregate lots of compute power on what you need. And that's the logo for Genie. Okay, so what I've been talking about is instead of more bandwidth is better, more responsiveness is better. And to get to more responsiveness, we need to decrease latency, decrease jitter, and a major step to be able to do those two things is to be responsive by having local facilities. There are other ways of reducing latency and jitter, and those are important also, but I don't have time to talk about all of those this morning. Let me move on to the second big point, is that today we tend to think of with a big enough pipe it doesn't matter, I can just toss it all together. And we're going to, I think, end up changing that paradigm. So first of all, let's go take a look at what I have at my place. I don't know if you have all of these things at your place, but um, that laptop right there is the one in the top right. I brought it with me today, but it lives at home. And you can see that I have a couple of desktops, one of which I bought for 200 US dollars. Uh, but still does a lot of interesting things, like record my television. I have my own home-built television recorder. Um, printer, the phone is this phone right here, it's in my pocket. So all of these things are contending for the bandwidth on my internet connection. And what happens is the tragedy of the commons, the traditional, typical tragedy of the commons, Today's internet only works well because the utilization is so low. If we had high utilization, it wouldn't work well at all. Uh, in fact, I have Comcast, as you know, and Comcast says that if you use more than 4% of your capacity on a long-term basis, your usage is excessive. And they have the right to go and charge additional money because I'm using excessive bandwidth. On my phone, which happens to be a Verizon wireless phone, they begin slowing down my data if I use more than 0.03% of the bandwidth available to my phone. Obviously, it costs them more on that basis. Now, that is on a 3G data plan if you have unlimited data usage, and it is a long-term average. So there's a little star footnote there. But the utilization being low is very important. Applications cheat. Things like Google search will go and violate the rules of sharing of the road. They will go and grab more than the bandwidth that they are entitled to. Voice over IP services will try to grab more than they are entitled to. Things that think they are better and want to be more responsive than other applications will grab more than they're entitled to. And there are entire companies like Video and uh, OpenClove who are based on the proposition of making video work well even when they're having to fight and claw for the bandwidth they need. So 
this will eventually come to a head. And the question I would ask is, what would data centers do? What would data centers do in this case? And the answer is, of course, what the data centers would do is they would go virtual. They would go and uh, have a virtual server per application. Instead of sharing this and putting them all on one server, we used to call that time sharing, they now go and they have a server per application, a virtual server per application. The server configuration is matched to the application it's running. They allocate these virtual servers as needed, dynamically, based on the load that's being presented. It provides for more fault resilience. And remember I said the business model. It's easy to bill the server to the application, right? You're dedicating a virtual server to an application, so you say, hmm, we're going to bill this server to the application. And the incremental cost model means that there's more total dollars because you get to charge every time more work gets done. So remember, what would data centers do in the situation we're about to face on the network? They would go virtual. What will happen on the network? I think it will also go virtual. I'm going to change the words here. Did you catch that really quick? I'll go back. Here's the data center. Now I'm going to change the word server to network. Instead of a virtual server per application, you have a virtual network per application. You create a virtual network for the application. The network configuration is matched to your application. You allocate as many of these as you need to run your application uh, dynamically based on the load. It is more fault resist resilient. It's easy to build the network to the application. And there's incremental cost for service providers. And in fact, it might not be the end customer that pays. It might be somebody who is bundling the service. So I think this is what's going to happen uh, in making that happen. Here's an example of a typical home. Um, yeah. Um, ordinary internet comes in. What else might you want to do? You might want to add another virtual network, maybe some telehealth. Somebody is elderly. They may have a diabetic ulcer, which needs to be checked up on. And you'd like to have privacy, and you'd like to provision a high bandwidth, high quality video link from the home uplink on demand. Maybe you would like to have a um, public safety application where every home has Wi-Fi that can be accessed by public responders or by citizens who are reporting an emergency and want to beam, for example, video of that emergency. How about interactive online education? The MOOCs that were talked about yesterday. How can we get high quality, low cost, specifically for that piece of education? Or what if there is something that is very life dependent? What if there is, I'm sorry, get that back there. I keep pressing it multiple times because it doesn't always work. Uh, dialysis control, that you need a high reliability connection. You need to make sure this connection always works because if not, you might be miscontrolling that dialysis machine at home. So these could all be Virtual networks using network function virtualization. I'm sure you will hear that term several times today to be able to provide multiple services into the same home over the same pipe. So again, here's my summary. I think that tomorrow, responsiveness, latency is going to be the order of the day. It's going to be provided in part by using lower latency equipment and products. They exist already for the finance industry. I think they're going to come into more widespread use. I think that keeping things local and being a locavore about being your computing is going to be important. The cloud comes to you to be more responsive and we'll end up with multiple dynamic virtual pipes which are purpose built and designed to run with the properties of each application. 
So if you would like to hear any more about this next generation infrastructure, see if I can advance the slide here. Uh, I invite you to come join us at an application summit, June 24th to 26th in Chicago. We're going to give demonstrations of applications in education, healthcare, public safety, based on the new technologies I've just talked about, and applications which, as I said earlier, are only possible because of these new technologies being used. So that is what I wanted to talk about this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Like to take a seat over there. You bet. Thanks very much for that, Glenn. Uh, an interesting range of new ideas I've not heard before. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, uh, if I can, that this sounds like a very US-centric, um, perhaps a US-centric problem, I don't, I don't know, perhaps a US-centric um, solution. We have an international audience here. How does it work out? How does it play elsewhere? Well, first of all, I believe that the issues and the problems are universal. Um, there are a few communities who have longer before they have to bump into them. For example, in South Korea, there is so much bandwidth that abundance will continue to work for more years than in places where there's not great such abundance. But it is true that uh, lots of folks are worrying about this. Last month, I was meeting with the European Commission in um, the Future Internet Assembly in Dublin, Ireland. Ireland is currently the presidency of the EU and talking about how there's a public-private partnership now being formed in the EU. EU. It's called the FIPPP, and if you go to fi-ppp.eu, you can see the public-private partnership that the EU is creating to be very similar to this. We've also seen that in Japan, there is a similar next-generation project to Genie. They are also creating a public-private partnership to do the same kinds of things as US Ignite is intending to do in the United States. There's been great interest from Australia. I have no doubt something will happen there as well. And I believe uh, other countries will also come along. In the uh, Southern Hemisphere, uh, Brazil has been uh, very active in this. And there's also um, lots of uh, interest from uh, Red Clara, including Argentina and Chile, uh, have expressed a lot of significant interest in making these things happen in their areas as well. Uh, one of the demonstrations that you're going to see at the U.S. Ignite Summit comes from Canada. So, uh, and actually a demonstration is coming from Poland also. We're going to do a 4K video feed from Poland of a 3D uh, augmentation coming into Chicago using uh, these new advanced technologies. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm also interested in where's the money coming from? I mean, at the moment, things like micro data centers or data centers close to where the data is required tend to be paid for by people like the finance industry who can afford to do that and they absolutely want the minimum latency. Now, that's all very well and good, but they've got deep pockets. Most of us don't. Indeed, and that is why instead of giving you a finance example, I picked on a different example. I picked on AOL. AOL does not have that kind of deep finance uh, interest, and yet they are finding that they can go and increase their revenues by going to this locavore model. And I believe that you're going to see more and more adopt this. So uh, this is a very exciting event today. I was talking about the fact that things are going to change and be very different going forward. And I think this is one of the things that you'll be able to track for the next two or three years, and you'll see it happening. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions from the floor? Hey, loads. Oh, good. Um, yes, Alan. Uh, Alan Weisberger, IEEE Communication Society, Santa Clara, California. Uh, I'm very intrigued with this concept, Glenn, but I have a couple of issues with the slide you showed on the different types of applications. The first is, how, let me uh, ask them both, then you can res respond. Uh, how are we going to get that ultra-reliable -reli connection or dialysis control or any other type of uh, automated health care? The second one is observation about uh, the community Wi-Fi uh, application. In the greater Bay Area, we were promised three separate community Wi-Fi networks. 
One was for San Francisco, one was for the city of Santa Clara, and one was for the whole Bay Area. They've all not materialized. The only one that has persisted is the Mountain View Network by Google. So how is that going to happen if uh, in Silicon Valley, the greater San Francisco Bay Area, the hub of technology, we couldn't make it? So thank you. Certainly. Let me address those in the order you presented them. The first one was the uh, question on how do you get ultra-reliable connection to the home for something like dialysis? And I have to be a little bit more technical, but you're IEEE, and I'm an IEEE senior member, so I think we can go right ahead and talk about the fact that within the network, we'll send the packet down multiple paths simultaneously to provide for the fact that if there's a failure on any one path, the packet will be delivered on the other paths. This is being worked right now in a demonstration project by Doug Comer, a name which should be familiar to many of you, including the international press, for US Ignite, and is being demonstrated in an advanced manufacturing scenario with uh, George Geschke at uh, Kettering University. So that gets the part to the, to the uh, edge of the network where you can have multiple paths at the same time. Going into the home, a separate, um, you can do this several different ways, but I choose to think of it as a software-defined network that has priority separation and guaranteed bandwidth. So we know that the person playing Xbox games in the basement will not be interfering with the communications with the dialysis machine on the second floor. The second question was about why the, sorry? Community Wi-Fi, Wi right. So why the heck should community Wi-Fi be any more successful than it has been? And I argue because it's going to be built out of what's already there. If you go driving down your street, is there any chance that you will not be within Wi-Fi range of at least one access point? No chance, right? Everybody's home has one, right? You may not be able to access it. What if there were a requirement for a second SSID, which is used only for public safety purposes, which is bound securely, perhaps cryptographically, to an application that is provided as part of the community emergency response system that could attach to any Wi-Fi that it can see from any of the major providers in that neighborhood and therefore be able to uh, do that access. So I think there's two factors that would make it uh, successful in the future. One is it's not general open, and access, general open access, it's just for public service. The second one is it's depending only on what's installed already. Although, although I, I'd argue that actually the, the, that the geeks uh, would actually replace their, uh, their service provider's router with something rather more, uh, rather more powerful and therefore cut off that route of access. And they're more likely to have the fat pipes. Uh, and I think that they are about 2% of the uh, population even in Silicon Valley. You could be right there. Okay, more questions. Yes, yes sir. Phil Keyes, Mido Media. Um, you, a lot, I think a lot of the presentation was more around um, how to handle high bandwidth applications. Um, could you make some comments on if there's anything in here that would help um, Internet of Things type of applications where you have lots of very low, you know, small pay with, but lots of them trying to uh, hit upstream? Right. I think that smart things are definitely going to take out. I'm on the Kickstarter list for some new Sparks. Um, I, my son's got an Arduino running and um, uh, also a wireless scale. So I think this is definitely happening. We will definitely see the Internet of Things. The reason I didn't address that is because you can run the Internet of Things perfectly well on today's Internet. It is a new thing. It is happening. But I'm trying to address things that, remember, wouldn't be possible if we didn't have an advanced technology to support it. And the Internet of Things is today occupying small enough bandwidth that uh, in general it can be done with today's internet. The one um, exception I will make is that some medical devices need in the United States to be compliant with a law called HIPAA, the Healthcare Information Portability Act, and that requires for extra security for those connections. And although there are a number of different ways of providing security that would be HIPAA compliant, one way is to uh, increase that security is to use software-defined networking or virtualization to put it onto a separate virtual network in the way I showed it on my slide. Okay, thanks, Glenn. We got, I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, Bob, I'll come, actually, I'll come to you, Wayne, in a second. 
Um, if I understand correctly, you've got sort of one relatively fat pipe which you partition in order to handle the different services. Not being rude, but that isn't exactly a new development. And I mean, you know, quad play, triple play to the home, use that technology. What is to stop the people grabbing some of that extra data, you know, that extra capacity? And at the beginning, you were talking about apps, and several of them, like the medical, for instance, are being done at the moment by the M2M community. Um, do you have uh, M2M players on board in your uh, organization? So I couldn't quite hear all the question. I believe it has to do with um, partitioning of a pipe is not new, which is, which is correct, right. but the partitioning in this way is new, and the ability to more easily build that to a particular customer is comparatively new, although, of course, as you point out, things like MPLS can already partition things. Uh, yeah, but the other, the other quick things, Manik, is uh, what's to stop those people grabbing some of that capacity? What's but, to stop people from grabbing some part you know, of that the, capacity? The, the bad guys, the Skypes and everything of the world. And the third thing, quickly, is those apps you had at the beginning. Many of those are being realized at the moment by the M2M community. The end-to-end -end community. The end, uh, what about the end-to-end -end community? I'm, I'm a big to part machine. of that. Machine to machine. A machine to machine. Uh, those those so, are important. So, 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 so two questions. And one, one is what's to stop apps like Skype grabbing all the, all the bandwidth? And, and the other one was... Right. So what's to prevent Skype from grabbing all the bandwidth? I believe that as we go forward and have these multiple virtual networks or partitionings of any kind, that you need some way of managing those partitions. And there are today some ways, uh, for example, in coax, there's a policy-based management to divide up the bandwidth on DOCSIS 2.0 and higher networks. But I think what we're going to find is that the things we used to do for operating systems and time sharing will reappear for networks so that we can go and better manage according to priority price utilization to make better utilization of our pipes. Although I would say on that point that my router already allows me to do that, to prioritize different applications. You can prioritize, but I dare you to go and say, give this between 10 and 15 percent, but no more than 15 percent, and leave at least 10 percent. You can probably say this is first priority, second priority, third priority. I can give, well, actually, my router is quite sophisticated, and I can do stuff like that. But it's, Excellent. It's not that common. You, you can tell me afterwards. OK, it's an, it's an, it's an AVM uh, Fritz box. Um, Wayne. Yes, uh, just a quick question. Don't uh, CDNs already take care of the local uh, services that uh, you were referring to as something we should be doing? Is all your content static? Content management. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Networks. I know what a CDN is, but is, is what you view on the web always static? No, but content management networks aren't always static either. Uh, that, that's true, but when you need some computation, for example, you're doing a uh, 3D model and you'd like to be able to rotate that model in real time, you need something that's more than a CDN. So, in a way, the Locavore network I'm talking about is the next evolution of a CDN, if you'd like to think about it that way where you now have programmable modules you can download. Not only is the content static static, not only is it replaceable static based on being able to fetch pieces of the page, but it's also dynamic in the sense that you can go and insert arbitrary code to do arbitrary things. An example I'm using is 3D rotation. Make sense? OK, I think we're going to have to cut it short there. Thank you short very time. much. Glenn, thank Thanks you very much. Thanks for the great questions.